Welcome to hour number three of the Gary Sutton Show on WSBA. It's always a pleasure and an honor to have us next guest. He's Dr. Walter E. Williams, professor of economics at George Mason University, author, commentator, columnist, sit-in host for Rush Limbaugh, former taxi cab driver, we found out. And he's with us here on the Gary Sutton Show. Good morning, Dr. Williams. Welcome back. Good morning. Always a pleasure to have you in. Which one of those are you most proud of? <laughs> That's a nice, well, easy question, right? Well, I think the, uh, the the proudest one was when I was driving. Well, actually, the most fortunate one was driving the taxi cab when I met my wife of uh, 48 years. Right. Yeah. It, it, and, you know, you, you talked about that one time. And, you know, you, you talk about trying to find out about people. I guess driving a taxi cab is maybe one of the best places you can be to find out the news and find out about people, right? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> and and when I was I was driving a taxi in 1957, and uh, and I, I made pretty good money uh, uh, because uh, if you got in my cab, I could direct you to where you could find anything, where you can buy anything you wanted. That's one of the great things about uh, drivers like that that they that they know the city. And you, were, I guess, I was in Philadelphia where you're driving. Yeah, right? Philadelphia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, we've been talking this morning about an article that I saw by Josh Krishauer yesterday. And it was in his blog called Against the Grain. It was entitled, The Secret Weapon to Win Over Voters in This Next Election, Authenticity. And I didn't even get to the first line of the article. It was actually it was pretty good. But I thought, wow, when did authenticity become a weapon instead of just a characteristic that we used in our country to get along? <laughs> Just wonder what I, you thought about that. I don't. I don't know. I, I didn't read the article, yeah. but I think <laughs> just the title that, itself, though. I mean, the idea that it's a strategy now instead of being, you know, like you don't go out, get up each day and say, "Well, I think I'll I'll try to be honest today." I mean, it's just supposed to be built in, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Well, it's it's supposed to be, but uh, uh, I, I I don't think that. Uh, unfortunately, I think that um, uh, being honest in the elections. Uh, or campaigning is is not a winner with the American people, because <laughs> if if people are honest and saying, well, look, I, uh, uh, you know, for example, James Madison, he says, look, ch- uh, uh, charity is no uh, legitimate function of government. Now, imagine, right. imagine a politician being honest like James Madison. What most concerns you today as you look around this land? I mean, you've seen it for a lot of years, and, and you've seen it change. And, uh, it, you know, you spend a lot of time talking about the things that have made it great. What, what do you see around our country today that has been changed for the good? And what do you see that's been changed for the bad? Well, I, I think that the, the if, if there's an optimistic note, uh, it's that uh, the the first two years of the Obama administration, when when the when the Democrats had control of the of the House of Representatives uh, and the uh, Senate and the and the White House, these people became so brazen in the kind of things that they were doing, uh, in, including Obamacare, uh, that. Uh, for the first time in our history, for the first time in my memory, Americans are now debating about the Constitution. Uh, they 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 formed the uh, the Tea Party movement. Uh, uh, state legislators had sued the federal government, uh, although they did not win the first case of Obamacare, but they've been making some wins uh, lately. And then then some state uh, legislatures have passed the uh, Tenth Amendment resolutions. Now all of this, I think, is, is is good news, and I think that it, it might be it's a possibility. It might be too little, uh, too late. But I think on the on the other side of the picture, uh, increasing numbers of Americans uh, know very very little about what made us a great country, and uh, and then they don't know anything about the uh, the Constitution, our rules of the game. Uh, they 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 don't they don't know uh, uh, what is the cause of American exceptionalism, and. Uh, and, and so I think that uh, a person that does not uh, know his history is very much like a person with amnesia. Uh, he, he, he doesn't know where he's been and he doesn't know where he's going. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that bothers me, too, that the Constitution no longer seems to be the law of our land, even though we swear allegiance to it if we are representatives, senators, presidents, and so forth. And yet at the same time, we're not quite sure what we're swearing allegiance to, that uh, you know we swear to execute the laws, or we swear to uh, abide by the rules in making the laws. Um, and, and yet, and, and even in the in Supreme Court and, and the federal courts, it seems like we've allowed our personal philosophies to sometimes get in the way of what the Constitution says we're supposed to be doing out there you're, you're absolutely right and and just look at at some of the response to um, 
uh, uh, Congressman Boehner's uh, lawsuit against the uh, Obama administration, and what he's suing uh, uh, is that uh, Obama, the, you know, Congress passed a law, namely the you know the uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, sometimes called Obamacare, and and the president is changing parts of the law. Or the parts of the law. Now he is able to get away with that uh, uh, to a large part, uh, with a large part of the American people. And so what I ask people, I say, well, look, if 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 another president comes, let's say a Republican uh, president comes along, would you want him to have to be have the? Would you want him to do the same thing? That is, ignore the United States Congress and and just write whatever laws he wants. Or for example, suppose Romney had be, had won uh, right. the uh, presidency, and he and he got in, and he said, well, you know, I I don't think that a fifteen percent capital gains tax is uh, is good. Uh, let's make it five. Let's let's get rid of it altogether. <laughs> Right now, now, people in the news media they'd be crying to the high heavens. Yeah, they'd be crying to high heavens, but they're they're not they're they're not doing the kind they're not they're responding the same way when the president and so and so I think one of the things that we have to recognize and one of the good things about our constitution is that the kind of rules of the game that you want you want the kind of rules that if your worst enemy was in power, right, it wouldn't make any difference to you. I'm, I'm reminded a little bit, uh, you know, you said about meeting your wife as a taxi cab driver, but I'm reminded that we have a chance to go in this country. The Constitution is about long term. We seem to be in a country today that is more about um, disposable. You know, if something doesn't fit right for a little while, we get rid of it. Um, we were just talking about marriage a little while ago being maybe one of those things for a lot of people that, uh, that are coming up through now in the, the newer generations. But I also think about it, at, we have a choice between choosing Miss Right or Miss Right Now. You know, we're, we're choosing Miss Right Now an awful lot without choosing Miss Right and so many of the things we have to deal with as a legislature, as a presidency, as a government in general today, and as people in general. <laughs> I think you're right. I think that uh, uh, I, I think that you know it's it's a really something deep seated that's relatively new in our in uh, in our history. I agree with that, you. That people believe that well, gee, they, they 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 don't have the responsibilities to take care of their own lives and their own business, and they ought to be able to depend on somebody else. And if you don't provide that, or if you don't make that uh, accessible to them, then you're an evil person. You're you're a sexist. You're a racist. You're a multi capital You're a multinationalist. You know, I, I saw a, a bill that was presented. It doesn't have a snowball's chance of getting through yesterday in an article written by Mark Bittman in the New York Times. And it was presented by Rosa DeLauro, who uh, in the New York Times, they said, is the brave and beloved 12-term congresswoman from New Haven who introduced a bill in the House of Representatives yesterday that would require a national tax on sugar-sweetened beverages. And as part of the article, very quickly, it says... A national tax would be much tidier because if the states did it, then different states would have different things going on. And I was struck by the fact that uh, they said, well, what are you going to use the tax money for? And she said, well, I don't know, but we'd probably use it for subsidies for fruits and vegetables in schools and for SNAP, the food stamp recipients, and anti-soda marketing campaigns. So I'm thinking here we are again. We don't want to outlaw something because we say it's so bad. And yet at the same time, we are willing as a government to go out and say, okay, we're going to hurt businesses, and yet we're going to keep them legal. And at the same time, we're going to tell you what you have to buy because you got to pay more tax on it. I mean, we've gotten into a time that's just kind of screwy for a lot of people, and the mixed messages that are sent out are voluminous. Well, well, I, I think one of the things that's, uh, uh, that people will do this stuff, or many people advocate it, because it, they, they, there's no repercussion. Now, can you imagine, for example, let's say like in these old Western movies uh, years ago, and there's John Wayne sitting at the bar, and he's drinking a great big cup of soda or whatever, or smoking <laughs> a cigarette, and somebody comes up to him and says... <laughs> Put that cigarette out, or or don't drink that soda. Right. Well, they would have gotten shot. Or Clint Eastwood on a newer level today would have been the same thing, right? <laughs> That's that absolutely right. But but people can they they can interfere with other people with with just and just impunity, you know. And and nobody uh, makes people pay now. And sometimes I think <laughs> I think violence is a fairly good response to people being a busybody. <laughs> 
I mean, yeah, and as yeah. I suggest, I for example, people uh, say, well, they want restaurants uh, uh, to have smaller helpings uh, because, uh, you know, because of obesity is such a problem. And I've told people who've argued about this, I say, look, don't be a coward. If you see me in a restaurant and you think that I should have one biscuit and tell two on my plate, just come up and take the biscuit off my plate. <laughs> and then face the consequences, right? <laughs> Something about the biscuit from my cold, dead hands rings there. I'm not sure. You know, I, I think what, what's really interesting today is that we have somehow been lulled into the idea that it's okay to be... We, we talk about independence, and then all of a sudden, the thing that we're dependent on gets attacked or gets challenged, and we say, oh, except for that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm independent except for that. I need to have that. Oh, this too, uh, yeah, and this over here. And and the idea is that we've been lulled into this dependence kind of mentality uh, in our society. Do you subscribe to that kind of thing? Well, I think we have been lulled into dependency, and the, and the simple reason is that that they're 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 people who are, are facilitators. That is, uh, uh, politicians uh, have become facilitators to tell people, look, uh, look, yeah. You know, for example, if if you lose your job, well, you don't have to take the first job that comes along. You don't have to work at McDonald's or or something like that. Uh, you, you know, just just uh, just keep on looking. Well, if you're getting unemployment compensation or if the or if the job at McDonald's it not taking the job at McDonald's, if that does not mean starvation and getting kicked out on the street, well then yes you'll 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 uh, you'll pick and choose. But if it meant starvation then you you take the job at McDonald's. So so what what happens is that uh, people certain kinds of behavior are cheaper and they're made and and they're facilitated by politicians who want your vote. We're talking with Dr. Walter E. Williams, who's a political science professor, uh, or excuse me, an economics professor, uh, political science observer, I would say, and also columnist and author, and also sometimes sitting host for Rush Limbaugh. The the thing that most strikes me, Dr. Williams. There is a time right now where we used – I think we used to trust – maybe maybe we never did. I'm, I, I could be wrong. I study history for a lot of time, but I'm starting to doubt it. Maybe we trusted the American people to make the right decisions at one point in time, and we wanted to stay out of their lives a little bit more. But today, it seems to me that those who we have chosen to represent us in a representative-style democracy, also known as a republic, don't trust that we can make the right decisions, thus the authentic decisions that really make our society go. Your thoughts about that? Well, I, I, I think so. I think you're absolutely right. And and what what happens is that we become so dependent, you know, on government. You know, like for for a politician can say, look, uh, we I, we demand that you wear a seatbelt when you drive in a car. We're going to pass a law rem- demanding that you have a helmet when you ride a ride a bike. And the and their argument is, is that well, look, uh, if you have an accident and you're and you're not belted, uh, you're not restraining your car, or you're bi- riding a bike without a helmet, you'll become a burden on society, and we have to take care of you. Well, then, then, uh, uh, and th- that's an invitation to control your life. You, you know, I, we, we don't want you drinking that great big. Uh, big gulp of soda because you'll become obese and you'll be a burden on on society right. well we'll see that, see that's not a problem of freedom a freedom of choice that's the problem of socialism well and that burden on society has become the catch-all comprehensive phrase that we use every time because we're all interconnected and you're screwing us over by what you're doing so i'm going to ask you a question when we come back dr williams okay. do we still have the right to be stupid We'll ask that question to Dr. Walter E. Williams when we return here on The Gary Sutton Show on News Radio 910 WSBA. Back right after this. I never had to take my gun out of its holster once. I'm proud of that. You're a good man, Lieutenant. A good man always knows his limitations. That was uh, Clint Eastwood in one of his Dirty Harry movies. Uh, Man's got to know his limitations, right? We also have governed our limitations, but it seems like the government's putting more limitations on us than normal. We're back with Dr. Walter E. Williams, our guest this morning. I'm just reminded about that. A man does have to know his limitations, That's and we have right. to know what's right or wrong for us, but the government keeps on telling us what's right or wrong for us and taking more of those choices away. Well, you know, you know I, I, as we were talking in the last segment, I was thinking about uh, my, my mother, when I was 14 years old, you know, when 14 year old boys, right. you know, they start smelling themselves, they want to take over the house, they want to do <laughs> this and do that and things like this. Mm-hmm. And so my mother told me, said, Look, boy, as long as you're living here and I'm paying the bills, you're going to do what I say. 
Now, maybe that's okay for children, but is that okay for adults? That is, the government is coming to us saying, look, uh, if you get sick or you get unemployed, you get blah, 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 uh, we're paying the bills, and so darn it, in the meantime, you're going to do what we say. You're not going to have that big gulp soda. You're not going to smoke. Uh, you're not going to go without a seat helmet because, because you, we're, we're, we're paying the bills, and we have a right to tell you what to do. Although today we see we're covering people with Affordable Care Act that are 26 years old still living at home, we start to wonder how long that kind of trend is going to go. We see a lot of people moving back home right now. Yeah. Uh, I remember my, my, I got the same kind of talk from my mom and dad, uh, and I remember that old saying about when I was 14, I couldn't believe how stupid my parents were. And by the time I got to 21, I couldn't believe how much they learned in seven years. <laughs> so it was always right. uh, kind of one of those things. Do we still have the right to be stupid in society? Or do we have, are we all connected and someone's always getting uh, a bad deal by what we do out there? And therefore, it's okay for society to be taken over by the government. Well, I, I think people have a right to be stupid, but at their own expense. Right. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> but, not, but not at my expense. But a lot of people are saying now, too, if we go back to what you were saying before, that, uh, you know, we're affecting other people. Therefore, we can't make those decisions, uh, you know. So the tie it into health care and all it, it seems like the government manages to tie it into everything that comes along and more and more they're creeping in and taking total control of our lives little by little. And again, the choices that they make with my money are choices that I now don't make with my money and thus no authentic economy, no authentic life out here, but rather that which the government contrives, it seems to me. That's right. And and when you talk about taking your money, uh, the the average American uh, in order to pay federal, state, and local taxes, he has to work from January 1st until towards the end of April. And and what does that mean? It means that we're going on four months out of the year, and we don't have the rights to decide how the fruits of our labor will be used. Somebody else makes that decision. And so this is... You know, a lot of people will complain uh, about uh, having to pay taxes, about this regulation, that regulation. But I think that most American people, uh, most of the Americans are asking for that. And keep in mind, with this working for the government for uh, almost six months, and, you, and they're taking all this money out of, out of your paycheck, the founders of this nation went to war with the mightiest nation on the face of earth, right. uh, Great Britain, because they did not want to work one week. For King George, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and if they came back and they looked at us, they would say they would. They, I think they would have contempt for us. And it was a bad bet too, because as I recall in studying my history, that about if we were taking popularity polls down, which we seem to base a lot of our thoughts on today, that about one third of the people in this country actually thought it was a good idea that we go out and fight for you know for the rights of Englishmen later on liberty. Uh, about half weren't sure, and another half were or about a third weren't sure, and another third were Tories or loyalists. Uh, so it wasn't really a good bet. But we yeah, ended up a, large, a large percentage were, were Tories, and and that was the great work of uh, of Thomas Paine. Yep. Uh, he was a pamphleteer, and he wrote Common Sense, and and he he he, he stirred up the revolution. He got Americans, uh, you know, they sold Americans on the idea of independence. I had a young man calling this morning who was talking about the ills of the country today, and one of the things he said he blamed it on corporations. He said corporations are reaping all the benefits. They're worried about profits. They're not passing things on down to the workers. And they have a responsibility to do that. As a man who teaches economics and has done so for a long time and is well-known and well-respected, how do you answer him? Well, I, I, I believe, well, number one, I believe a corporation should be, obey the law like everybody else. Yes. But I think the the corporation's main responsibility is to their is to their uh, their stockholders and and the way that they and to make a profit and the way that you make a profit in a in a uh, free society is to please customers get customers to come in and buy more and more of your stuff and so when corporations are 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 serving their stockholders and by getting profits well the only way that you get profits in a free society is by pleasing your people and matter of fact if if you look around the if you look around at our society you say well what areas of our lives do people complain about the most well they don't complain about their computer stores they don't complain about their movies they don't complain about their clothing stores their supermarkets what do people complain about they complain about them the motor vehicles division the uh, the, the or the uh, uh, the post office or the public school and what's true about those last three that I mentioned that's untrue about the other ones well the the uh, schools and, and 
and, and motor vehicles and the post office, they are nonprofit or operations. That is, they can do whatever they want or do a lot of things that they want to do. But they, they don't have to worry about pleasing the customers because there's no penalty to it because their pay and raises are going to go on whether they please the customers or not. But not your supermarket, not your computer store, or not your clothing store. So if you don't like the conditions that you have of that employment, then you need to find something else where you do get conditions that you aspire to, right? That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And so, and so, and and matter of fact, the people who want to control our lives, they they are they are very much anti-profit, the anti-profit motive, because the profit motive makes you pay attention to your customers. Let's say in a free society, I'm not talking about uh, when, when you have crony capitalism and you're getting a lot of favors and handouts from government. I'm talking about the free enterprise system right. where you you where you're where your profits depend on pleasing your customers. And again, there are consequences if you don't. You go out of business or you have to change and make something else or do something else. Dr. Williams, it's always fascinating to be with you. I really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much for giving us your insights. Take care. Have Have a great day. Dr. Walter E. Williams with us here on the Gary Sutton Show on WSBA. We're going to put that up on the website at facebook.com slash 910WSBA if you'd like to hear it again. I I think Dr. Williams has a way of looking at things kind of like Forrest Gump's mom did. Mama has a way of telling me things that I just didn't understand.